Bonjour, good morning. Thank you, Victoria, for that very warm welcome. What a pleasure it is to be here in Montreal this morning with all of you. I have some friends who are academics who work in this area, and their research has to do with immigration, dispersion of people, and then I have other friends who work within the community in St. John's in Newfoundland, um, and they do work with new Canadians, help them get integrated, find homes to live, um, help their children get enrolled in school, help them find health care. And so I told my friends that I was coming here to Pathways to Prosperity to give this keynote, and they all spoke very highly of this conference and this group of people. So I'm particularly honored to be here. The Boat People is a novel. It begins with the arrival of a fictional cargo ship, and on board are 503 refugees, asylum seekers who have fled Sri Lanka at the end of the Civil War. They have survived bombs falling from the sky, they've survived illness, they've survived this terrifying ocean crossing, and they arrive on Vancouver Island and they think, okay, the worst is behind us, now we can start our new lives. But that's just the first scene of the book, so of course you know that's not quite how it goes. Instead, they are all escorted directly off of the boat and taken to prison. The novel is told from three points of view. At the heart of the book is a young man called Mahindan. He is a widower. He's arrived in Canada with his six-year-old son, Selian. And then the second point of view is of their refugee lawyer. Her name is Priya. She's a second-generation Sri Lankan Canadian. And in addition to being a somewhat reluctant lawyer for some of these people, including Mahindan and his son, her family has some dark secrets that have to do with their time in Sri Lanka, which are revealed through the course of the book. And then finally, there is Grace, who is a third-generation Japanese-Canadian, and she is the adjudicator who works at the Immigration and Refugee Board. She is the one who holds Mahindan's fate in her hands. It is up to her to decide whether he and his son will be allowed to stay and start their new lives, or if they will be deported back to certain death in Sri Lanka. And so that is the book. Um, and it takes place in Vancouver between the years of 2009 and 2010. So we writers, when we decide to write about something, we do our research. And we do this very particular thing where we dive in deep to the research. But, and as a result, we become experts, but in a very, very narrow field. And so my expertise of uh, refugee law, of the Canadian immigration system, is really limited to those years of 2009 and 2010. But of course, my book came out um, this year, in January. And so for the last 11 months, I've been going around and chatting with readers, and they all want to talk about what's happening today. They want to talk about the timeliness of the book, which is not something I could have ever predicted it would be. They want to talk about the policies in Canada now, what Trudeau is doing. They want to talk about the third safe country agreement. They want to talk about the refugees who are walking across land from the US coming here. And to be perfectly honest, I don't really know about any of those things because, again, my focus is so narrow. And so when I was invited to come here to speak to you, I thought, what could I possibly add to the conversation that you all will be having this weekend when all of you, your expertise is so much wider than mine? And then it occurred to me that you have asked a storyteller to come. And so I think it's in all of our interests if I just do my job and tell you a story. Two stories, arrival stories. The first begins in the far east, in the freezing, foggy waters off the coast of St. Schatz, Newfoundland. It is August 2011, 1986, a Monday, about three in the afternoon. 155 people are crammed into lifeboats, two lifeboats. They've been here for three days, setting off flares that have gone unseen. They are cold, they are hungry, and they are terrified. 
These people are Tamils, and they have come from Sri Lanka, a tiny island nation known as the jewel of the Indian Ocean. They have fled their homeland because the country is at war. And it is a brutal conflict waged between the majority Sinhalese and the minority Tamils. A war that is only in its third year. But by the time it is over, it will have killed 150,000 people, most of them civilians. Far from all of this, from their homes and loved ones and everything they have known, bobbing in a foreign ocean and a part of this ocean that the locals call the, quote, graveyard of the Atlantic, these castaways don't know it yet, but they are the lucky ones because they are the ones who got out. Not far away from them is the Atlantic Reaper, a fishing vessel whose crew have been out all day catching cod and haddock. The skipper of this, skip, of this ship is a man called Gus Dalton. He spots the two lifeboats, sees the people, all of them frantically waving, and radios the Coast Guard. But it is two fellow fishing boats that reach him first, and together they form a rescue party to bring the Tamils to shore. 155 men, women, and children, including two babies. And just keep those babies in mind, because they're going to become important later. Now, the island of Newfoundland is no stranger to arrivals by sea. And what happens on this August Monday is just another chapter in a much longer saga that began with the maritime archaic peoples and the Dorset and continued with the Beothic, then the Norse, the French, the Basque, the English. And next came Gus Dalton's own people, the Irish. Wave upon wave of boats and people washing up on the rocky shores. And now, August 11th, 1986, here is Gus putting his hand out and helping the newest arrivals step on safe, dry land. So if this was a movie, this would be the point where the music would swell and the credits would roll. But this is real life. And we are, if not at the very beginning, then still in a very early chapter. As soon as the Coast Guard was called, as soon as the asylum seekers arrived, the international spotlight turned on them. McLean's magazine ran a cover story with the headline, Desperate Voyage, the Tamil Refugees' Bizarre Story. The Washington Post newspaper stated, Canada feels duped by Tamil refugees. And the Montreal Gazette asked that perennial question, are we a soft touch? Now, the federal government of the day was conservative. And when called on to make a decision, they acted conservatively, carefully. Under intense pressure to deport the newcomers, then Prime Minister Brian Mulroney decided to do the opposite. The asylum seekers were brought to St. John's and housed in residence buildings at Memorial University. The federal government issued a minister's permit which allowed people to work and access health care and enroll their children in school. While the paperwork for the refugee claims limped its way through the immigration system, people could get on with starting their new lives. As you all know better than I do, the system can be slow and mired in red tape. It can take years before final decisions about permanent residency are made. So for now, Let's leave our new friends here at this hopeful start. And let us cross the country from east to west and go to the other coast, to Esquimalt on Vancouver Island. 
because British Columbia is no stranger to arrivals either. This land story begins with its indigenous peoples as well, the Haida, the Coast Salish, and so many others. And then next, the Spanish, British, Chinese, Japanese, Sikhs, and then on August 13th, 2010, almost 24 years to the day after the Tamils arrived in Newfoundland, another boat appeared. The MV Sunsea, a rusty cargo ship bearing 492 survivors of that same Sri Lankan civil war. Once again, the international spotlight turned on a group of Tamil refugees in Canada. Boatload of migrants, a wake-up call, the Globe and Mail announced, and RCMP pulling out all the stops. It was the federal conservatives who were at the helm of the country once again. But unlike their predecessors, they chose to err on the side of intolerance. This time, there would be no minister's permit. Instead, everyone was escorted off of the ship, put in handcuffs, and thrown into prison. Unlike their compatriots, who had arrived two decades earlier, these Tamils languished in prison for months, some for years. It was what one journalist called a hard welcome mat. When I was doing my research for the book, I was continually checking in online to see what new things I could find. And in 2015, about two years into drafting the novel, um, which was five years after the MV Sunsea's arrivals, arrival, the Canadian Council for Refugees issued a report. And in it, they revealed that the passengers on the ship were subjected to intense interrogation and prolonged detention. Immigration legislation was amended to give the government new powers, many apparently unconstitutional, to detain people and deny them a wide range of rights. I am quoting more or less word for word from the report here. Even before the ship arrived, the Canada Border Services Agency sent a memo to its officers telling them that many people on board were likely to be refugees but also instructing them to one, try to keep people in prison for as long as possible, two, argue against them being recognized as refugees, and three, try to have them deported on the grounds of criminality and security. If you've read my novel, The Boat People, and this is not giving anything away, you will see the CBSA lawyer, Amy Singh, making all of these arguments. But what was the reason for this harsh treatment? According to the CBSA memo, all of this was to be done in order to, quote, ensure that a deterrent for future arrivals is created, end quote. So this government also acted conservatively, mean with their compassion. And to what end? to send the country and the world a message. The door is closed. Now you are all more expert in these matters than I am, so you will know that under Canadian law, there are two ways for a person to claim asylum. You can apply to be a refugee from outside Canada, put in your paperwork at the high commission or embassy in the place where you live, or you can arrive at the border and take your chances. By boat, by plane, on foot, this action of coming to the border and begging for sanctuary is perfectly legal, and thousands of people do this every year. Every day, in airports across the country, people disembark and say to the customs official, I'm here to claim refuge. Please do not send me back. But when people show up in a plane in small family groups, no one seems to notice. 
the spotlight isn't on them, and their refugees' claims proceed through the system quietly, unremarkably. And even though marine arrivals, so-called boat people, make up only a tiny fraction of asylum seekers, they receive outsized attention. And the situation devolves into what one character in my book calls a sideshow. So I thought about this a lot as I was thinking about writing my book. I thought about the rationale for this. What do we have against boats? Is it that they're old fashioned? untrendy? Do they hit too close to home, reminding us of our own arrival stories, how most of our own ancestors came here, disembarking, dirty and bedraggled off of a boat? Is this what makes us uncomfortable? Or are we just irrationally suspicious of anything that is out of the ordinary? When the MV Sun Sea arrived, then Prime Minister Stephen Harper said, quote, Canadians are pretty concerned when a whole boat of people comes, not through any normal application process, not through any normal arrival channel. As a writer, I'm always interested in words. Normal. Other words were tossed around carelessly, words like illegal and cue jumper. The people in power, many of them lawyers by training, knew better, but they repeated these lies anyway. And I know the words alt fact are very popular right now, but let us call it what it is because words are important. These are lies. And why did they do this? To quote, ensure that a deterrent for future arrivals is created, end quote, from that C CBSA memo. So when I was research researching the novel, I looked back over this country's long history of irregular arrivals. Draft dodgers, the Underground Railroad, ships like the MS St. Louis that came in 1939, full of refugees who were Jewish from Eastern Europe and were turned away. The Kamagato Maru that came at the turn of the last century from Northern India. In 1995, there were four ships that arrived from China. So I looked at these ships and I looked at how these people were treated. And then I read the refugee law textbook. And what I learned is that we have laws and a system in place but also that our elected leaders often intervene for better and for worse. And as a result, the system is a capricious and often there is, there is a gray area, there is that gap between the letter of the law and what happens when you arrive. Who you are, what you bring to the country, the peril you have fled, sometimes these factors seem to matter less or not at all to the reception you receive. And instead, how you are greeted is determined by three things. What mode of transport you use to get here, what mood the country is in when you arrive, and what message politicians want to telegraph to the rest of the world. When the Prime Minister stands in front of reporters and says, and I quote, we will not hesitate to strengthen the laws, we are responsible for the security of our borders, end quote, that is a careful, there's a, that is a carefully crafted message. And when the nation's leader meets you at the airport with a hug and a parka and all of the reporters are there, that too is publicity. I am more interested in what happens when the cameras are not rolling. The work that you all do, policy decisions, boots on the ground, long-term actions, those are what is important. So now, let us move back east to Halifax. 
A month after the MV Sunsea arrived, it was September of 2010, and I was in Halifax. It was raining, and I ducked into Pier 21. Before air travel was very common, Pier 21 was one of the main ports of entry into this country, welcoming something like 1.5 million people in the years when it was active. But in 2010, when I made my first visit, the historic site was a modest museum, thoughtfully curated, fully immersive, and already slated to become something greater, a national museum the only one we have in Atlantic Canada. It is today the Canadian Museum of Immigration, a place to showcase our diversity, our generosity, and the warmth of our welcome. A year before I made that first visit, the Prime Minister had gone there himself to announce the new designation, the expansion of the museum, and a significant funding package to support that expansion. In his comments in 2009, then Prime Minister Stephen Harper declared, quote, Pure 21 symbolizes who we are, a nation of newcomers bonded together by a common quest for freedom, opportunity, and democracy. A nation of newcomers. I wandered around, mesmerized by the exhibits doc documenting new arrivals. Hungarian refugees, the Vietnamese boat people, war brides, child evacuees from Britain, Holocaust survivors, and many, many others. I saw archival photographs of crowds packed on boats and heard their testimony of being seasick during these long ocean crossings. And while I was there, I came across this quote in an exhibit. Something an anonymous immigration officer had told a new arrival. You have come to a good country. There is room for you here. It struck me as perverse that here I was on the East Coast in a place that was dedicated to celebrating our openness and generosity, while on the West Coast, the newest arrivals were in handcuffs. My family is also from Sri Lanka, and my father is Tamil, which is why we aren't there anymore. And if you will indulge me, I just want to tell a little history lesson about Sri Lanka. Because recently, actually, I was at a party and this very tedious man kept following me around and trying to tell me that, quote, India and Sri Lanka are the same country and, quote, they're all Hindu there anyway. So fun fact, not the same country. <laughs> also, not all Hindu. <laughs> Sri Lanka, as I said, is an island nation separate from India but sharing the same ocean. The two main ethnic groups are the majority Sinhalese, who are Buddhist, and the minority Tamils who are Hindu. In addition to the different religions, they have different languages. Sinhalese comes from, Sinhala comes from Pali, which comes from Sanskrit, and Tamil is a Dravidian language. So a little bit like the English and the French, they also live in different parts of the country. The Tamils tend to live in the north and the east, and the Sinhalese live in the rest of the country. But in the capital city of Colombo, for a long, long time, Tamils and Sinhalese lived and worked side by side. They intermarried, as my parents did, and they were friends. A little bit like the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda, because unfortunately, these genocide stories often begin the same way. And so for centuries, Sri Lanka played host to a revolving door of squatters. The Portuguese, the Dutch, the English. And then finally, after centuries of colonial rule, after the Second World War, the English left, and the country got its independence back. And after all of these centuries of foreign rule, there was a kind of nationalist revival where the Sinhalese majority looked around and wondered what the minority Tamils were doing here. Why did they have all these good jobs? Why did they have all these nice houses? Who do these minority people think they were? This was a Sinhalese country. 
Singala first, the majority said. Sri Lanka for the Singalese. Does it sound familiar? And so through the late 50s and 60s and 70s, this ethnic tension was rising and rising and rising, and the whole thing blew up in a three-day riot in the capital city of Colombo in July of 1983. And that sparked the Sri Lankan Civil War. And it also sparked a diaspora of Tamil people. And so today in Canada, there are about 200,000 of us Tamil people living here. There are more of us in Australia, in the UK, in the US, and elsewhere. My family was relatively lucky. Seeing the writing on a wall from a young age, my parents had already left and were living in the Middle East by the time that war broke out. And a couple of years later, they moved the family to Canada. As it happens, we arrived around the same time as the people arrived in those lifeboats in Newfoundland. Just a couple of weeks later, at the end of August of 1986, we flew in here to Mirabel, which I don't think it exists anymore, right? Our circumstances were more fortunate. My mother had been working for a bank in Dubai, and they had agreed to give her a job in Toronto. But we benefited from that same spirit of openness and generosity of the kind that was extended to the Tamils who arrived in Newfoundland. We were given access to healthcare and education before any of us had contributed a cent to the tax pool or the GDP. When I think about the place that welcomed us, I think of a country, a good country, that saw two adults, a senior with arthritis, a seven-year-old with a truly unfortunate bowl cut, <laughs> and a baby. And that country said, not with empty words or political platitude, but with actions, you have come to a good place and we will make room for you here. What? <laughs> What Canada did when they accepted us was to make an investment. And as with any investment, the payoff is never guaranteed. There's no crystal ball to predict if you are welcoming a wife beater or a future governor general. Of course, the same could be said of babies who are born here. And from time to time, I hear grumbles about elderly immigrants. What's an old man or woman going to contribute to the economy, to society? Won't they just be a drain? My grandmother never had a paying job. She cooked and cleaned and was there when my sister and I came home from school. That made it possible for both of our parents to have careers and for the household to bring in more income and pay more taxes for all of us to have a more comfortable existence. My grandmother died 10 years ago. My parents are both retired now. My sister and I went to school, we got jobs, we got married. Our lives are so ordinary, and that is the point. To live an ordinary existence in a safe, rich country is a miracle. Truly, when you consider the current refugee crisis, the 17 million people displaced around the world, civil wars raging everywhere, and schoolgirls kidnapped for daring to learn algebra, this here and now is a miracle. So as I wandered through the museum in Halifax eight years ago, Ensconced in the nostalgic past, my mind also on the ugly present, I was feeling vaguely connected to those asylum seekers in British Columbia who could just as easily have been me. But also seeing this drama unfold from a great physical and psychological distance. And I was thinking, my God, what people endure just to come here just to have a chance at all the freedom and safety that I take for granted. 
and I was disgusted too, appalled by the willful doublespeak that allowed us to celebrate our openness, our generosity, our common quest for freedom on one coast while simultaneously slamming the door shut on the other. 2010 was the year that Vancouver hosted the Winter Olympics. Patriotic fervor had reached a kind of pitch that past February, and even in September, the country was still buzzing in the Olympic afterglow. I too was in an unusually patriotic mood, having spent the year before living in the UK, missing home and feeling foolishly sentimental about the maple leaf. I thought about all of these things as I considered the dilemma of the MV Sunsea, because it was a virulent nationalism that had spawned the Sri Lankan civil war in the first place. And in some quarters, it was an ugly strain of nationalism that was causing Canadians to recoil at the sight of a boat packed with brown people. Nationalism, you see, it can be good and bad, two sides of the same coin. I wasn't a writer then in 2010, but three years later, when I did sit down to start my first novel, this novel, that day at Pier 21 came back to me and all of those mixed emotions about patriotism and the poignant words of that anonymous immigration official. You have come to a good country. There is room for you here. Now, I don't know if all immigrants are like this, but in my family, we do not take our citizenship for granted. It is a privilege and it comes with responsibilities. My mother, for example, was incensed when the long-form census was temporarily scrapped. She didn't see it as a burden, but as a duty, our job as citizens to fill out a little paperwork from time to time. I believe our responsibility goes further. We have a duty to be good patriots, to look at the country from coast to coast, up and down, and see it for what it truly is, to celebrate the good and try our best to call out the bad. It is our duty to vote, to be on juries, to fill out the census. And these are privileges too. It is a privilege to be included in the justice system, to be represented in polls and in StatsCan data, to stand up and be counted. It is a privilege to count. So the story of the MV Sunsea is ongoing. Some people have been allowed to stay. <clears throat> Others have been deported. There was a high profile case that went to the Supreme Court last year. That's about as much as I know. And even for those who were allowed to stay and start new lives, these are still very early days, early chapters in the long story of their time in Canada. But if there's one thing I've learned in the last 11 months of promoting my book and talking to readers, it's that people seem to really crave their endings neatly wrapped up in little bows. So I'm gonna give you an epilogue a happy ending to that first arrival story. In August of 2016, there was a three-day celebration in St. John's, Newfoundland. Maybe some of you were there. It was the 30th anniversary of their arrival, and a big group of Tamil Canadians returned to celebrate and thank their rescuer, Captain Gus Dalton. Three decades had passed since those lifeboats were found floating in the Atlantic, and these one-time refugees were now citizens. Older, some with a little more weight, a little less hair. In the intervening decades, they had established careers, started businesses, raised families, bought homes, put down roots. And remember I told you to keep in mind those two babies? One of them is now, I am told, an engineer, and the other one is a doctor. So there you go. Classic immigrant success story. Thank you very much.